Okay, so welcome again to the Asia Climate Web Workshops 2020. Um, this is our first module, our first session for our first module. And the next two sessions are going to be on April 17 and April 24, respectively. So what is the idea behind the module one of the web workshops? So in light of the COVID-19 quarantine situations in some of the countries in our region, we're hosting this three-part series in preparation for the Earth Day Digital Strikes, but also to center empathy and community care to build the community of practice in our region. We really want to connect with, with our fellow um, people in the climate movement, but also in other movements. And we want to inspire each other with our real on-ground stories about campaigning from different countries. So in these trying times, our goal really is to stay off of isolation in pursuit of solidarity within the climate movement, but also in other progressive movements. And we hope that this is our innovative way to sustain relationships built within our network while bringing to the fore and enriching discussions on the values underpinning our work. So um, let's look a little bit more into the future first. So the first point is that I will be sending you a feedback and evaluation email throughout the next three weeks every Monday. So after this call, um, we will, I'll be sending you the form on Monday. And that will also include information on how to join the next webinar, which is going to be on digital campaigning and um, preparations towards the Earth Day digital strikes. The second point is that the second module, which is going to be launched this June, will be entirely about fossil fuel finance and investment. So if you're interested in how um, fossil fuel projects are funded all over a region, how you can um, run campus divestment campaigns in your schools, um, and many more related topics, um, keep an eye out for invitations for that June module. And my last point um, is that the first ever online Asia Climate Leadership Camp will begin applications by June, and this is going to be on August. But just to anchor a little bit more into the present, we have three simple goals for today. The first one is to learn more about just recovery as a concept. And as we operationalize it um, in our specific contexts, maybe understand what it means as a practice also. The second one is to arrive at a collective understanding of what exactly these principles mean for us in our Asian context. And lastly, as we hope to open up a space where um, a lot of us can speak to the values underpinning these principles by sharing our respective views. So if you can notice, and if you've read before, the five principles under Just Recovery on the tpt.org website, you'll see that they're broad enough that there's room for interpretation and for it to be contextualized in different countries. Um, but it's the same values that are underpinning them. It's also the value of um, community care, solidarity, and um, in, in our Philippines, we call it bayanihan. So basically just being um, present and being a hero to your neighbor. Um, but it can be different, of course, in, in different contexts. So we really hope that this space is our safe space where we can speak to that and what we think are the common denominator values that underpins our work and the Just Recovery concept. For now, though, I'll be um, introducing today's speaker. So um, today's speaker is my wonderful colleague from the 350 Asia team, Chuck Baklagon. So he currently serves as the Associate Director for Asia Digital Campaigns at 350.org. And prior to joining us, he spent a decade building up the digital campaigning capacity of Greenpeace in Southeast Asia. So Chuck became involved in activism while studying first degree in journalism at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. And he was also involved in the youth organizing work that led to the second EDSA People Power Revolt and the abolition of the ROTC in 2001 here in the Philippines. So when he's not working, he divides his time between biking and looking after his aged parents. So um, I'll be facilitating the session after this, but for now, I'll be handing over the floor to Chuck. So um, welcome, Chuck, and thank you, everyone. Hi, Bea. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So what I'll be doing now is I'll just be giving an overview of the Just Recovery Principles Keeping in mind that we are all operating on different contexts, and as, as Bea mentioned, it is also about uh, looking at it through the lens of uh, our different contexts and how we could interpret it when we operationalize the principle. So now I'll be sharing my screen, and um, I'll also share the link to my presentation on the chat. 
Can you guys see my screen? Okay, so cool. So I'll be going through the principles briefly. Um, so it's five principles and I'll be show, sharing with you the overview and the context and prospects for how you can implement it uh, in your countries. Uh, the first slide, I'd, I'd like to direct your attention to the heading. It says, uh, acknowledge, recognize, and understand. Um, I, I've chosen those three as the title because uh, one, we all know that uh, one, we have to acknowledge, which is about having a, an awareness, self-awareness of our state. Uh, we need to recognize because we also have to come, we have to understand or have an awareness of the brokenness of the system and understand because we have to gain consciousness of the connection between the system and us and how things must change. Um, and I'd like to start with acknowledge. Uh, I know that all of us are feeling differently towards the current crisis. Um, earlier before the call, we were prompted to do an emotional check-in where we are guided through a question of how are we feeling and we would rate it on a scale of one to eight uh, with eight being good and one maybe being low um, I know we all have different um, backgrounds and different feelings and um, maybe now is a good time to uh, if there would be volunteers to share what their answer are to the survey and maybe the volunteers could think about a single word that describes what they're feeling. Um, maybe put an asterisk if you would want to answer the, if you'd like to volunteer. Maybe just three volunteers if, if they'd be willing. Um, okay, um, no volunteers. Uh, yes, thank you, Hinako. Uh, would you like to share? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Chuck. Um, in general, I'm feeling good, but today I'm physically feeling ill. So, uh, sorry, one word, right? Um, ill. <laughs> I'm sorry. I spoke more than one word. Thank you. Um, any other volunteer? Uh, Lestina? Hi everyone, Lasrina from Singapore here. Um, my one word is energized. Um, I know there's a lot of things going on right now, but I feel like I, for me personally, I've taken some time to reflect and meditate a bit. So it helps and yep, feeling energized a bit right now. Good, thank you. Um, maybe a last one? Who would like to go on last? Go ahead, Luna. Hi, I'm Luna. Um, my word is tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Actually, I, I, that's the first thing, right? We, we come here with our own uh, feelings. And, and we come here because we are affected by many things, including the immediate environment or things that happened earlier or how our body is feeling. And, 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 and as we approach 
uh, this time to come together and talk about uh, how, how to respond to the crisis. Uh, I, I want everyone to know that whatever feeling we have, whether it's fear, frustration, grief, whether we are angry at someone with indignation or whether we are angry because of what we're feeling, those are valid and those are welcome. And, and I think that's something that we have to keep in mind, uh, knowing that uh, one thing that has been exposed by this crisis is that uh, more than ever, what we need is everybody coming together in honesty about where we are at, at the moment. Another thing that we have to recognize is that uh, what was normal then is what, was, what brought us to this crisis. Uh, and that's why we have to understand that things has to be done differently than it was before. The quote on the left captures it perfectly. Uh, it comes from a magazine called uh, Ad Adbusters, which is uh, um, a good critic of uh, the you know, corporate consumer worldview. But it says that normal never was actually. Normal was, act what was normalized were actually things that are detrimental to the planet, but also to our well-being. And uh, that's why we have to look at this as an opportunity also to come together and look at things and come together to do things differently than before. Um, and I'll go to the next slide. Um, what was the context for the recovery uh, principles? Um, well, here I, I, I'd like to say that beyond the virus, uh, we are existing in a, in a current society that uh, interact with other systems, right? And it is happening on the backdrop of the following. The first bullet there is that there is greater government subservience over corporate interests. So when, when I have to admit that the, the principles came about because it was prompted by the 350 US team. And, and when I say that there's government subservience to corporate interest, I, I mean that by saying that uh, at least in many countries, the default response has always been to make the legislature approve stimulus packages that bails out corporations, meaning that they would release national budget to invest in corporations so that they wouldn't go broke. Um, that, that was the de facto response of the U.S. Go government, similar to many other crises that, that came before, uh, just like the real estate crash of 2008, when the stock market crashed, and when Wall Street crashed in 1986. So that was one of the things that prompted. And you will see that under principle three of the just recovery principles. But in some places, like the Philippines, it could also mean uh, how the government is using uh, its force to keep corporations uh, operating. Uh, here, we, 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 we recently saw an incident where police and military were deployed to break up a year-long standing barricade in a place uh, called Nueva Vizcaya, which is being done actually to enforce a law because the mining company there, Oceana Gold, has already an expired operating permit, but now it's being used to um, enforce how the mine should operate. Um, also, it happened in the context of global upheaval. Uh, already, we are seeing a lot of uh, response to what to things that happened politically in the previous years. Like in previous years, there was a rise of uh, right-wing and populist governments that have been quite oppressive to their citizens. But it's also a time where there is now unprecedented uh, upheaval against those governments. And uh, that is why in many places, just like in the Philippines, uh, the crisis has also been used as a means to quell dissent. Uh, where there are currently more than 17,000 cases of warrant arrests, arrest. Uh, there are well-documented cases of violence, dis violent dispersals, coercion, assassinations, and many other forms of human rights abuses under the lockdown 
in Luzon. And, and, and I know it's also something that's happening in many other parts of uh, the world. Um, also, there's, uh, it, it was brought forth in the context of uh, polarized geopolitics, meaning that um, there's growing tensions between the relations of China and US. Uh, these relations are all even more exacerbated by how some world leaders respond, just like with how Trump went out of his way to change his speech to name COVID as the Chinese virus. And there's also happening in many parts of the world where there's an increase of hate crimes directed towards Asians, believing that the virus originated from there. So it, it highlights uh, that. And also how the language being used in responding to the virus can be confusing and sometimes not helpful. Just like the term social distancing. Um, it's equals to, again, talking about isolation rather than solidarity. It means moving away from everybody else. And I think the, the illustration on the left, uh, which was done by my friend Johnny, uh, highlights that. Uh, at our very nature, we are biologically wired to be mobile or to move around. We are wired to be social, so we speak with others and meet with others. And communal, we live with others and thrive within a community with other people. And those are exactly what is happening in the context of the lockdown. And maybe here I'd pause if maybe some of you would like to share or would like to ask clarificatory questions before I move to the next slide. Feel free to input a asterisk on the chat if you have any questions. Okay, so, so I, I guess there's no questions. I, I'll move on to the next slide, if, if that's okay. Oh, Luna, you have a question. Go ahead. I, um, I still don't really understand what just recovery is. Could you explain that to me, please? Well, I, I'm, I'm just at the context, so the next slides will be oh, okay. Sorry. just recovery. <laughs> Okay, so let's proceed. Maybe that's a cue to proceed to the next slide. If you'd go to the website, the Just Recovery, 350.org slash just dash recovery, the website opens with this statement saying that the choices we make today will shape our society, economy, health, and climate for the decades to come. Um, earlier, we said that uh, all our feelings are valid. And for sure, because we are growing through something that we haven't experienced before. Therefore, the choices that we would be making would mean that it would determine the direction of how we would be surviving and thriving in the decades to come. And uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that there are immediate things that need to happen, such as the humanitarian response, which precedes recovery. We also need to think about in our immediate context in our countries, right? Uh, likewise, we need to start making conscious effort on how we will steer the direction of the way society functions. Um, the principles are discussions on the choices we need to do. And these are choices that need to be led from the bottom up because as experience uh, gives us, uh, many world leaders have failed to address COVID-19 and the many existing crises that runs alongside that urgently, equitably, and humanely. And uh, if you look at the principles, uh, you'll see that it can be looked at in three phases. The first phase could be the immediate, which is principles one and two. Uh, then there's an interim, uh, which bridges the immediate and the long term, which is principle three. 
and the long term, which is on principles four and five. Uh, as decision makers take steps to ensure the immediate relief and long-term recovery, it is important that they should consider a concept of intersectionality, which says that there are interrelated crises of wealth inequality, racism, and ecological decline, and most notably the climate crisis that we are living in right now, and how those risks are being intensified because of the virus. And uh, that's why it is decisive to steer that conversation now. Um, so I, I'll start with the first principle. Um, the first principle is uh, about resources. Uh, put people's health first, no exception. Uh, the explanation there is that resources should go through health, go to health services everywhere, and that access should to healthcare should be granted for all. Uh, this belongs in the immediate bracket because most pressing is treating people afflicted and making sure that the virus doesn't spread. Um, also, it recognizes that access to medication, treatment, and preventive care should be accessible to all, not just those who can afford to pay for it. Um, it also means that if we are involved in uh, government, or we are lobbying government in how it allocates its bu budgets. It means that a bulk of its budgetary allocation should go to healthcare, not in ramping up other things like civil defense units or the military. And lastly, as a movement, it's also a reminder for us activists to heed the advice of medical professionals around physical distancing, hygiene, and sanitation. So, yeah. Uh, are there questions on the first principle? Or maybe insights that you'd like to share? Or should I go, go ahead? Cool, so I'll proceed to the next slide. Principle two is uh, provide economic relief directly to the people. The explanation on the slide is to focus on people and workers, particularly those marginalized in existing systems. Uh, we need to look at short-term needs and long-term conditions. Um, much like the climate crisis, the impact of COVID-19 clearly shows the unjust conditions that the existing system subjects people to where the poor and the marginalized are rendered most vulnerable. Not only to the risk of contracting disease, actually, it's more about the immediate impacts of halting economic activity. And there's a growing number of consensus that says many more might actually die of hunger and unemployment rather than of the disease. So, so that's part of the crisis that's happening. And if these vulnerabilities and inequities are not instability. Already we are seeing unprecedented outrage of the hungry. In some places there are cases of near riots or near looting of, place, of uh, supermarkets. And uh, for, for us again activists, it's also a call for us to respond to supporting localized humanitarian interventions. Because here we need to understand the context of the places we are working on. And we are made aware of the needs that we need to respond to. And, and here the principle just says that uh, focus on the people who are most vulnerable and at risk. Um, and that economic relief should directly go to the people if we would be considering recovery from the crisis or response to the crisis. Um, are there any questions or things that you'd like to clarify? Or should I go to the next point and reserve the questions towards the end of the presentation? Okay, so, so, so I take the silence as proceed with the next principle. <laughs> 
uh, principle three is um, health workers and communities, uh, not corporate executives. The explanation there is to focus on people and workers, particularly those who have been impacted in the current uh, crisis. Um, here we have to understand uh, that um, when we are talking about responding or transitioning to, from response to recovery, um, we have to understand uh, that you know the principle that we operate in when we talk about climate justice, common but differentiated responsibility. That might also apply in this context. Um, just look at how the virus spread. It started with, in Wuhan, it spread through tourists with disposable income and then migrant workers got infected and then that's how it traveled globally and understand how currently society is being kept afloat by those same blue collar workers people who are working in healthcare, uh, the people who are cleaning after us, the people who are manning the stores, um, the people who collect our trash, they are the most impacted and at risk, not the CEOs. And if, if there's something that I'd, I'd like to qualify is that maybe if we would rephrase number three, uh, I, I would rather say that uh, help workers and communities before instead of not corporate executives because it is just talking about uh, having a preferential option to those who are most at risk and who are most vulnerable rather than people who has the resources to cope and to thrive amidst the crisis. Um, yep. So I'll, I'll go to the next principle. Second to the last is uh, create resilience for future crisis. Uh, this is this runs alongside the discussions that uh, the climate moving is also movement is also having around just transition, where we must create millions of decent jobs that will help power a just recovery and transition for workers and communities to the zero carbon future we need. Um, here we need to highlight. Uh, that in principle four, we are talking about the need to build back better because the kind of society that we constructed was the one that got hit the most by uh, the crisis, the pandemic. Also understand the intricate link between resilience and ecological sustainability and acknowledge that there are clear benefits to changing the way we organize society that moves away from what we have under normal, which is extractive and throwaway or disposable. Um, and also recognize that this transition towards resilience has clear benefits in terms of jobs, livelihood, and quality of life. Um, I'll move to principle five. The fifth principle is build solidarity and community across borders and do not empower authoritarians. The rationale there is that technology in finance should go to lower income countries in the, global in the global perspective, right? And communities to allow them to respond using these principles and to share solutions. Uh, so, There's a question around uh, zero carbon future. I'll, I'll reserve my response to that uh, later at the presentation uh, af after I finished going through the five principles. Um, but here we have to understand uh, on principle five that it is an invitation to understanding thing that things must change and that things can change. Um, it is also, uh, how we have to realize that we are existing in a fragile system that interacts with many other systems and uh, that we currently depend on. Much like the climate crisis, the outbreak challenges us to exercise uh, empathy and solidarity. Uh, it's understanding that those who benefited and are still benefiting from the status quo 
are using the outbreak as a means to contain dissent and free thought and to understand that the forces of those who benefit from the status quo only win by making us feel alone. So that that's why we need to build solidarity. And it's also an invitation to know that we can rely on each other only if we act according to the realities of science, which is uh, determines the course of action and how we would be responding to the virus and the crisis in the short term to the long term. But also, it should be guided by the principles of justice. Um, yeah, so th those are the five principles. Um, I I'll share this presentation with the rest of you. Uh, and, and Bea would send it out. Um, and then one thing that we have to understand is uh, I, I've, I've been looking at how people respond and analyze the crisis. And I, I've looked at it through Twitter more than Facebook. And, and here's one of the tweets that uh, <coughs> I think has good truths that... Uh, exposes us to recognize that many of our assumptions of what is essential in society needs a reconfiguration. Uh, we need to reconfigure or reorient our priorities, both macro and micro, <coughs> both in the personal and social dimension of our lives. And it calls us to move outwards rather than inwards. It calls us to do away with the myth that the economy is built by executives when in fact society now and the economy now is being kept afloat by the workers. Uh, it tells us that we are a global community. We are not isolated countries that should pursue our national self-interest over the global need to survive and thrive together. It tells us that uh, healthcare is not just a privilege of the few who can afford it, but it is a human right. Therefore, it should be universal. And it tells us also that how we can survive is out of giving more rather than accumulating more because uh, generosity is greater than greed. And uh, here uh, I'd like to direct you to another tweet that we cannot go back to normal. Um, the principles are intricate, intricately linked with how we understand climate justice at 350. Is that we need to emerge from the crisis better. It is not uh, just about gaining, finding a cure or coming up with good technology, but rather it's about overhauling the system. And this, of, this time is... Uh, one of the very seldom moments in history where if, if, if you remember when you're running on a Windows operating system and the computer hangs and you hit control out delete and end task the software that are not functioning well this is that just like that moment in history for, for ourselves where we could end task oppressive systems so this moment is also a crisis slash opportunity moment only if we recognize that the crisis encompasses many facets of our lives. Therefore, it is existential, omnipresent, and intersectional. Only if we recognize that the old development paradigm needs to be changed. Only if we recognize that we need to disrupt the status quo of complacency because we can never go back to normal. And um, maybe I'd, I'd close with uh, this quote that I read from an article that was written by Rebecca Solnit uh, entitled, uh, The Impossible Has Already Happened. And uh, this comes from a friend of mine, which she quoted <laughs> in her article. And if, if we are thinking about the just recovery principles and how it, inter it relates to us, all we have to do is look at the experience of what is happening now, where we see that there are acts of people who are stubborn enough to refuse despair, yeah. violence, and indifference, and arrogance, which is being prompted to us or triggered by world leaders. And uh, this quote shows us insight on what 
has been achieved by humanity so far in a month? And what more if we would be guided by principles that would inform how we would be operationalizing it in our respective countries? And the last slide is just uh, some resources that you would like, if you'd like to le learn more. Um, the first link is the Just Recovery Principles. And uh, it's also an invitation for you and your groups to sign up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chuck. Um, this was very insightful, and I'm sure we're all very inspired to go on. I'm seeing a couple of questions on the chat and also the Q&A tab. Um, but I'd like to center, before we um, ask Chuck to answer a few of these questions, I'd like to center the next um, 10 minutes on trying to understand or trying to think about um, what specific action points or interventions we, in our own capacity as activists, whether we identify as activists or advocates or you know, um, someone who just wants real change to happen, what specific interventions can we take um, that are under the framework of the Just Recovery Principles? Um, as I've mentioned earlier during the introduction, um, the Just Recovery Principles are flexible enough um, and broad enough to be able to be contextualized in our specific contexts. And we have that task at hand to do that. So, um, you know, understanding each of them requires also an understanding of how we as activists and advocates can take part in bringing about the change we need um, in our respective countries. But before we open up the open discussion for that, um, Chuck, maybe you would like to address the three questions that were posed um, by Peichi and two from Dana. Oh, sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, uh, I was on mute. Um, so I, I'll start with the first question about uh, in the Q&A tab, where it says, how do we specifically attain zero carbon yeah. future? Um, here I would uh, answer briefly around the concept of decarbonization. Um, it means uh, doing rapid and far-reaching transitions in the way we use land, energy, industry, um, building, architecture, transportation, and how we organize cities. And that means under the Paris Agreement, we would need globally to get net human emissions of carbon dioxide to fall by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030. And uh, the target there is to go net zero by 2050 um, to keep global warming below 1.5. And, and that means that uh, coal, oil, and gas need to stay in the ground and that we must dramatically increase the transition to locally distributed renewable energy systems. Uh, I could send more information about that. Um, the second one is about an example of returning to normal, building out industries is likelihood that airlines will be lobbying. I'm not sure the ICAO, uh, what that means. For exemption, um, I think how does 350 intend to organize campaign around this? Um, from what I understand in the conversations being led by the global organization and the US team, they would want to have an itemization of where the government uh, stimulus package should go. And for sure, they would include um, exemptions on, on tax. But I think the, the, the crucial number there is uh, where those money would be allocated. And, and for that, they would want to highlight that there should be no um, do you call this? inclusion of uh, bonuses or salaries of the CEOs and the shareholders. Um, the next one under the Q&A tab, uh, I'll have a look. Uh, it's again from Dana. Since we can never go back to normal, how do we ensure that there is that no one is left behind? What principles or action points should we prioritize, especially in helping those who are underprivileged or marginalized? 
Um, uh, here, I, I would like to direct the the five principles. I think covers it, um, but maybe on a practical sense, as organizers or activists, uh, what we could do is actually um, four things. Um, one is hold regular discussions and study on climate change and uh, how it relates to the crisis. Um, this is something that uh, we would to do once the quarantines have been lifted is to reach out and immerse with marginalized sectors and um, participate in their struggles because how that happens is relative to the countries where we operate in and therefore uh, it, it uh, um, has to be harmonized with that. And, and I, again, I, I could share more resources on how that could happen. Um, now I'll move to another question from uh, Lastrina. Um, Singapore's context, the government announced three rounds of support announced in February, March, and April to help workers and family, families tied through this period. Um, oh, she, thank you for sharing that uh, resource. Uh, the question is for countries where the government providing so much already, where do you see we can contribute in aligning the five principles? Uh, offhand, uh, I think the five principles uh, could be used very much in um, interventions around uh, budgetary allocations, where the money should go. Um, in the long term, the principles can also be something that we would that would be useful for the longer discourse around uh, just transition, particularly under conversations that are related to the, I, I'm talking here as a climate activist, in the nationally determined contributions of our countries and in the long-term uh, development uh, program of our respective countries. Um, There's a question from Samuel um, in the Q&A tab. Curious about what kind of interventions measures can be taken when providing economic relief to people. Humanitarian aid was brought up by Chuck. I feel it's often conflated with military aid. What is your take on this? How should we ensure that such relief efforts are sustainable and beyond short and sudden spike in funding assistance. Um, one thing we can look at is uh, how do we, if, if you're familiar, the core humanitarian principles. Uh, it, it could be a good guide on how humanitarian relief should not be conflated with military aid. Um, the CHS is a, a good point there. Uh, if you want to review the CHS is uh, something you could look at. I, I could share the link to you. Um, and then I'd, I'd go back to the chat. Um, Mohammed, uh, our government in Pakistan has issued a stimulus package for construction industry, introduced massive extension on package, ta tax exemption package for those who will invest in construction of housing. Do you think this is a right approach at this time for recovery? Um, I'm not sure of the particular uh, circumstances of why the government arrived at uh, that itemization of your stimulus package. But what, what, what would be good actually is uh, if you'd look at where the tax exemption would be going. Um, is it uh, going to the investors or, it should, or it, would it be going to the income tax that the employees of the people in construction industry would be applying for. Um, hope, hope that 
answers it. Um, it it's not. It's just something that came top of mind for me. Um, another question is from Jeff. Uh, some people are happy that COVID nineteen happened, accepting that certain people, especially the marginalized, need to die to reduce population. But we who works in the climate movement know that this is wrong and it raises the concept of eco-fascism. How can we elaborate and correct dangerous thoughts for our campaign? Well, a short answer for that is, um, one, we, we have to recognize that uh, compassion precedes uh, achieving our in sustainability goals. And that, just like in climate crisis, uh, human rights and um, ecological sustainability are should not be put to get put against one another. Um, I could share with you a good uh, article about it uh, that was that came out a few weeks ago in the crisis. It particularly is a reminder for uh, environmental activists on how they should be talking about the COVID-19 crisis. Um, wow, there's a lot of chats, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so maybe I'll just answer uh, another, ah, here's, uh, from Hussein. Uh, carbonization and climate change, no doubt, are the major issues of our time, but I'm still unable to understand the logic of linking them to COVID-19. Um, I think here we're not linking them it, as something that uh, should be addressed hand in hand. What, what we're saying here is that uh, climate, the climate crisis still exists even as COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic happening and therefore we should keep a look out on how we should be organizing society for the long term recognizing that the climate crisis is present um, but in terms of how ecological problems are linked with the COVID-19 there's a growing body of literature scientific literature that says uh, that the virus came from wildlife and, and there you would start to think that maybe the destruction of wildlife habitats, um, hunting and other forms of human intrusion into key biodiversity regions might have a hand in um, spreading the virus because viruses operate as in vectors. Um, Hope that answers that. I, I'll send, I'll type in my answers for every question in the Q&A. And maybe the last one is, uh, I'm not sure if it's a question, but it's uh, about Singapore's government uh, around provisions and gaps. Um, not sure how to respond, but uh, thank you for, for the questions. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you for those who keyed in their questions. So um, I'm seeing that we only have five minutes left, and um, obviously the just recovery concept and framework and all the five principles, we have a lot of discussions to do, but we meant this first session to be just, you know, to jumpstart discussions in our own communities, in our own groups. Um, later, I'll be giving you myself and Chuck's contact information, so if you want to have further discussions about specifically your questions that were raised today. But for now, I'd like to close in three parts. The first one is I'd like to invite everyone to type into the chat one word that sums up their key takeaway for the session. And I'll give everyone two minutes to do that. Just type one word that is like your key takeaway from the Just Recovery session. <laughs> 
Okay, so I'm seeing here resilience, equity, inclusive, compassion, environmental justice, solidarity, resilience again, systemic, cooperation, inclusive, and many more are coming up. So um, those are great. I, I believe that we'll be having a lot more conversations about this, um, incorporating the five principles into our work in the future. So, but for now, I'd like to um, go over the next steps for the module one of the Asia Climate Web Workshops. Um, the first point is that information about the next webinar, which again will be about best practices in digital campaigning towards the Earth Day digital strike. Um, the information will be sent to you by Monday evening. And that email will also include a feedback form so you can help us improve the way we do things here. Um, we really want these sessions to be really useful, not just for our relationships, uh, building our camaraderie and solidarity within the movement, but also so that our work, our actual on-ground work can be informed. Um, lastly, I would just like to leave you with my contact information in Chops. So if you have any questions, if you want to continue the conversations that were initiated in this session, um, if you have other concerns or if you have suggestions or tips, on how we can make this better specifically, um, please don't hesitate to send me an email at beatrice.tulagan at 350.org. And you can also reach Chalk at chalk at 350.org. Um, but for now, um, we'll be closing this session. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, guys.